Good morning, everyone. This is the Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. Regular meeting of the NAGS Head Board of Commissioners is hereby called to order. I'd like to recognize former Mayor Bob Mueller in the audience today. Appreciate you and the work that you've been doing uh, with our committee. If you will please join me in a few moments of silence. And now if you'll stand as you're able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, the next item on our agenda is the adoption of the agenda, and a motion would be in order. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda are uh, several recognitions, and first I will call uh, Director Nancy Kerwin to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome Kevin Ford to Facilities Maintenance. He started on April 4th. He recently moved here from Mechanicsville, Virginia after vacationing for several years. He has two sons who still live in Mechanicsville in the area and work in HVAC. They're technicians. Kevin is an experienced maintenance technician and enjoys working outdoors and is excited to be a member of our team. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I will call on Amy Miller for another new employee introduction. We're so excited to have Faye Sims, our new payroll specialist, here with us. Um, she's been here since April, and she's definitely settling in her role. She's already processed two payrolls, the board payroll, longevity <laughs> payroll, so she is definitely used to high volume, fast paced work. Um, her career spanned uh, mainly HR and payroll for over 30 years, um, but she's worked in, in accounts payable and invoicing, which is a great fit for our department. She has knowledge of a lot of the different functions within the finance department. Um, she worked for a large construction company in Maryland for over 30 years doing their payroll. Um, most recently, she worked at a local CPA firm for the past three years where they um, tried to get her to stay and create a national face day day. But <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have that now at the town of Nags Head. We're gonna have face day every day, <laughs> as long as I'm here at least. Um, so in a nutshell, she's highly qualified, highly specialized. We're so lucky to have her and thankful. Um, and we're really looking forward to now that um, everybody getting to know her now that kind of COVID protocols have been lifted and she really thrives in a team environment. So I think she's gonna be a great fit for the town. Um, she has a great personality that meshes with everybody. Um, so on a personal note, she's moved here five years ago. Like I said, she has over 30 years of experience um, doing high volume payrolls in Maryland. Um, she's been married for 31 years and she said her husband had lived here 35 years ago and they've always wanted to come back. They vacation here with their children and of course they love the area like we all do. Um, she said she was born in Georgia but moved to Maryland again and she has two kids. Um, her daughter lives here and her son lives in Blacksburg with his wife and she has four grandchildren which I know she adores and enjoys spending time with. She loves to take long walks on the beach and working outside in the yard and again we are so thankful to have her. Thank you Faye. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Cravante Gibbs. He started with the town on April 25th. Uh, Cravante <coughs> likes to keep active by playing basketball <coughs> regularly. He likes to play video games with his friends and relax when off work. 
Coravante is excited to work for the town and to be a part of our team. Very good. Coravante is. Welcome. <laughs> Exciting to see all these uh, experienced new hires coming on board. Very good. Um, it is. The next item on our agenda is a recognition for five years of employment. I'll call on Chief Wells. Hold on, I've got to get the glasses out. <laughs> good morning, Mayor Cahoon and distinguished commissioners. It is my pleasure to bring before you for recognition firefighter Ben Williams. Ben started his career with the town of Nagshead on April 3rd, 2017. Ben is a lifelong resident of the Outer Banks. Ben has constantly sought to improve himself. He's worked hard to become a North Carolina emergency medical technician, North Carolina child seat technician, technical rope rescue, vehicle machine rescue, water rescue technician, and fire instructor one. He's recently completed his fire inspector one course and is preparing for a very hard North Carolina state fire, uh, fire inspector exam. Ben loves coming to work and enjoys the team aspect of the fire service. His devotion to the community goes beyond Nags Head. He's a member of the Buxton Volunteer Fire Department and Hatteras Island Rescue Squad. He serves on Dare County's Fire Officers Guidelines Committee. And on this committee, he helps to develop countywide guidelines to increase firefighter safety and survival. <coughs> he has proven himself to be an excellent firefighter, and he has the respect of his severe, uh, supervisors and peers. Ben lives in Buxton with his soon-to-be wife, Maggie. On his days off, Ben owns and operates his own power washing business. And in what little spare time he has, he enjoys it on the water with his family and friends boating and fishing. Ben is a shining example of what it means to be a Nags Head Fire Rescue. He serves our citizens and visitors with courage, commitment, and compassion. Distinguished Board, I present to you Ben Williams. Nancy, you're a busy lady this morning. <laughs> well, welcome back. Thank you. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, Chad Forrester for his 15 years of service. He started in April 2007. His hobbies mostly revolve around woodworking, as he learned that from his father. He has his own CNC machine, mills his own wood, and makes many things, including signs and cutting boards. In 15 years, Chad has acquired extensive knowledge of the town and its properties and can be the go-to employee for answers to questions only a veteran would know. Chad has a good attitude and is always looking to help other employees in any on-the-job opportunities. And we're glad to have him. Yes, indeed. Chad's one of those folks, you see him out there everywhere, all, it seems like everywhere all the time. <laughs> so appreciate, appreciate your service very much. Uh, next, Chief Webster for uh, an advanced law enforcement certificate. Mayor, commissioners, thank you uh, for allowing us to recognize Detective Mike <laughs> Alvarez on a career milepost. In November, Detective Alvarez completed work on and was awarded the state's advanced law enforcement certificate. The Advanced Law Enforcement Certificate is a component of North Carolina Department of Justice's Professional Certificate Program. Mike had already met and received his intermediate certificate. Mike came to the department with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from East Carolina University. He was able to use his education and entered the certification program in the baccalaureate track. Achieving the advanced certificate required Mike to complete an additional 480 hours of training and have a total of six years law enforcement experience. Mike is not taking his foot off the gas, and he's already working toward his next milestone of certification, the Criminal Investigation Certificate Program. Mike has excelled as a detective, and is already operating a high-level 
and goes to extraordinary means to solve cases. And I can't emphasize that enough. He's really operating beyond his years of experience. And I am so thankful to have him on board. Yep. Thanks, Absolutely. Mike. Absolutely. I know we have one more item in this category um, uh, before public comment, but I just wanted, since we've re recognized so many new employees and, and these employees and their, their service and their certifications, I, I just want to say what a pleasure it is. You know, it makes our job easy as board members, and it's a real tribute to boards that came before us, um, the kind of culture that uh, the town has created that we are able to get and retain the kind of uh, incredible quality employees that we are able to have and so we appreciate all of them uh, very much so thank you uh, the next item on our agenda is a proclamation for police officers week and Phil are you gonna speak to this I have the proclamation I'll leave that up to you, Mayor, if, you wanna... um, uh, if, if uh, we may this is a proclamation for National Police Week um, and if I, I will read this for the, uh, for the board's action. <clears throat> Whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day in the week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week. And whereas the members of the Nags Head Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the residents and visitors of the town of Nags Head. And whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their law enforcement agency, and that members of our law enforcement agency recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression. And whereas the men and women of the Nags Head Police Department unceasingly provide a vital public service, and whereas uh, each of us should take the time to reflect on the ultimate sacrifice Sergeant Earl Murray Jr. made for the town of Nags Head on May 15, 2009, and the rest of the officers who have done so nationwide, and let each of us keep their families, friends, and all fellow officers in our thoughts and prayers. Now, therefore, the Nags Head Board of Commissioners calls upon all citizens of the town of Nags Head and upon all patriotic, civic, and educational organizations to observe the week of May 11th through 17th, 2022, as Police Week, with appropriate ceremonies and observances in which all of our people may join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to the responsibilities have rendered a dedicated service to their community and in so doing have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and security of all citizens. Therefore, we do hereby proclaim the week of May 11th through 17th, 2022 as Police Week and call upon all citizens of Nags Head to observe the 15th day of May. 2022 as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of those law enforcement officers who, through their courageous deeds, have made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their community or have become disabled in the performance of duty. And let us recognize and pay respect to the survivors of our fallen heroes. This the fourth day of May, 2022. And a motion to adopt a proclamation would be in order. Before we adopt the proclamation, can I just, I'm glad the proclamation mentioned Sergeant Earl Murray. I'd ask that the people in our staff and people in our community remember uh, his wife, Kim, and daughters, Sammy Jo and, uh, and Paige. Uh, just, I believe it was yesterday, there was a North Carolina Peace Officers Memorial Ceremony held in Rocky Mount. I believe the deputy chief and chief went out and uh, were with the Murray family during that. So it's been 13 years, but it uh, still doesn't get any easier for them but I appreciate the proclamation from the police department and us accepting it as a board. Thank, thank you. I, I, I know that does mean something to you uh, at a personal level. And I would also like to say on behalf of the town, we appreciate you and your years, years of service <coughs> as, the, as the chief here as well. I chief, second. any 
I second uh, his motion. Uh, we have a, we, Thank we'll you. call that a motion and a second. Um, Chief, anything before we vote? No, just sort of echoing some of the thoughts of Commissioner Brinkley, uh, the Deputy Chief and I and Detective uh, uh, Lipscomb attended the services yesterday and it really sort of brings everything home when you see Kim and Paige and we got to spend some time with them and also when they read off the 24 names of officers who fell this past year. Um, it's just, you know, start reminder of, of what we do and what the men and women of law enforcement do every day. And I really want to say thank y'all, Mayor, Board, thank y'all for this recognition. All right. Thank you very, very much. much appreciate it. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. The next item on our agenda is uh, public comment, and I will turn the meeting over to Mr. Leidy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Every month, the Board of Commissioners welcomes members of the public to provide comment uh, to the board. This is an opportunity for people to share concerns and matters of interest for the board. It's not an opportunity for dialogue, and the board rarely responds to public comment. But um, anybody who wishes to address the board uh, should approach the podium and then address your comments to the whole board. I will be keeping time and I'll let you know when your five minutes is up. Additionally, anyone who's here to speak on another matter that's scheduled for later on the agenda, such as the uh, public hearing we have in a few minutes, should reserve their comments until then. So is there anybody who wishes to make any public comment? If not, we can conclude the public comment session and Very well. um, Thank proceed. You. Thank you, John. Appreciate yes, that. The next item on our agenda is the consent agenda, which you have before you, and a motion would be in order. <coughs> so moved. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Thank you. That brings us to our public hearing, and I will again turn the meeting back to Mr. Leidy. Thank you very much again, Mr. Mayor. At this time, we will begin the public hearing to consider uh, the town's adoption of system uh, development fees. Um, this is uh, a matter that is, uh, it's a legislative matter, so um, people who wish to comment on this uh, do not have to be sworn. Uh, but we'll begin by the, I believe that the, uh, the town finance officer, Amy Miller, will introduce this item. Um, this was an item, um, a memo I had written back in February, and I believe we discussed it at one of our budget workshops. Um, essentially, we are uh, statutorily required to review our system development fees um, for new construction every five years. And so uh, this is, we have completed a uh, review of our fees by a qualified firm to do so. Um, and the request would be to change our system development fees to $2.79 from um, $1.77 using the flow chart. Uh, the methodology and calculation is the same, just the um, gallons per day changes. And um, we have followed all the statutory requirements as far as advertising on the website for over 45 days. I don't believe we've received any comments, but Carolyn can confirm that. So we followed the statutory process for this and the request would just be to change our ordinance as well as change our fee schedule to accommodate the new findings for um, our system development fees. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions for Ms. Miller? <clears throat> if not, all right, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, does any member of the public wish to comment on the uh, proposed system development fees? Does the board wish to receive any other information on this? I will point out, <clears throat> uh, just to compliment what Ms. Miller said, that there's a statutory procedure that the town has to follow in order to uh, adopt these fees. The town has followed that process. This started, as she said, back in February. Uh, there's a public comment period and um, additional notices that have to be required. Uh, and so the town has exhausted that process, and so now this is ripe for the board's action. So if there's no more public comment, uh, at this time, we will conclude the public hearing and the board may deliberate on this proposal. Very good. Thank you. Uh, board members, any uh, comment or discussion? Uh, in that case, then, uh, can these be done as a single motion? Um, I know we have to change the ordinance and we also have to change the fee schedule. So okay. So I let's do let's do those as two. Two That's motions right. then. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, so the, the first uh, motion would be to adopt the ordinance. I make a motion that we adopt the ordinance as presented. 
Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the ordinance as presented. Any discussion? Hearing none, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. Uh, and then the second motion would be to adopt the modified fee schedule. So moved. Second. I, I have a motion and a second to adopt the modified fee schedule. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate that. That brings us to uh, reports and recommendations from the planning board and the planning and development director and uh, planning director Kelly Wyatt. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this will be fairly brief. I just want to touch on a couple things. And of course, if anyone has any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer those. Uh, one of the more exciting things that has happened that I wanted to report out on that didn't make it into the report um, is that we did promote our senior environmental planner, Kay Jones, um, to the deputy planning director. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and um, announce that. Some very exciting news. Um, the planning board at their last meeting, which was on April 19th, uh, they heard a text amendment request from Eddie Goodrich which was essentially to increase the gross floor area for cottages within a cottage court. It was also to um, change the architectural design to increase that uh, maximum height of a dwelling from one and a half stories to two stories. We only had four planning board members attending that meeting due to some vacancies. It was a quorum. All four um, voted to recommend denial of that amendment as it was requested. Um, coming up at our planning board's next meeting, which is on May 17th, um, we're going to have a text amendment request to add a use for um, remote control RC rentals, um, along with having a track and other facilities to operate those on within the C2 district. Um, we've been approached by someone who's interested in having this type of business over on the causeway. Um, the ordinance doesn't currently address it, so we'll need to see what type of amendments are needed um, and move forward with that. Also, we do have a uh, sketch plan review. It um, didn't make it into your packet, um, but that's going to be for 4413 South Croatan Highway on the corner of Croatan Highway and Danube. That's going to be for a mixed-use development. Um, like I said, at this time, it's just sketch plan. Um, so we'll have that before the planning board with anticipation of getting that to the technical review committee um, in June. Uh, we didn't have any board of adjustment hearings uh, for the month of April. Decentralized wastewater, you're going to be hearing an update on that shortly, um, hopefully with anticipation of adoption. The Estuary and Shoreline Management Plan, we do have a meeting coming up for that. It's going to be on Thursday, May 19th um, from 3 to 4.30. With our Resilient Coastal Communities Program, um, Deputy Planning Director Kate Jones and um, Candace Andre, the project manager with BHB, uh, you're gonna be hearing from them, uh, I believe it's next up, with an update on our Resilient Coastal Communities Program. Uh, looking through some of the other items on here, um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions if you have them. Not a whole lot of progress on some of these. Uh, just yet, I did want to go ahead and mention that as far as our Committee for Art and Culture goes, um, they are going to have a presence at this Saturday's Art Rages um, with the Dare County Arts Council. So it's going to be from 10 to 3. Um, and we'll have town staff and Art and Culture Committee available at that. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Only a comment. Kelly, I was really <coughs> excited to read the. Uh, Farmer's market coming along and the opening date coming up. Very yes, excited about that. Very, very exciting. We got all of our um, acceptance letters out, which was pretty impressive. I think Paige has been managing that really well. Um, also, knowing parking is sometimes an issue. She's had a lot of really great communications with our vendors about expectations. So, thank you. Very good. Excellent. Board? All right. Seeing no other comments or questions, thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, the next item is an update on the Resilient Coastal Communities Program, and I'll call on Kate Jones.
and congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so today we have Candace Andre. She's the Senior Project Manager from VHB giving us an update on um, the Coastal Communities Program. Um, and so we've got, Michelle's got her set up um, on Zoom. So just give us a moment. And um, Candace is going to go through a slide presentation to update you all. And then there will be time for questions. Um, and additionally, I will then update you all on the next phase, which is phase three, okay. which um, We'll, um, we will be moving towards and applying for. So we'll update you guys on that as well. There we go. Okay. So. Can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yes. Can you perfect. hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. Yes. Great. Are you able to share your screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Are you ready? We are ready. Okay. Yeah. I uh, just awesome. did a slight introduction, um, but but take it away. Okay. Please let me know if you guys can see this. Yep. Yep. We can. Thank okay. you. Perfect. Um. All right, well, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Candace Andre. I'm really happy to be in front of you today. Um, we have been helping the town of Nagpad with phase one and phase two of the Resilient Coastal Communities Program. Um, so today we just wanted to remind you of the project description. Um, and if you haven't been involved, kind of give you the background of what the program is give you a little bit of progress to date, including the community input that we've received, um, and then give you an idea of what's coming next. So just as a reminder, um, the Resilient Coastal Communities Program is really a program implemented by the state of North Carolina um, to help coastal communities with funding and technical assistance for resiliency strategies. So um, really looking at how to prioritize resiliency projects in your town um, and not only thinking about the typical hazards, but just on a normal daily basis, how to be prepared and resilient um, in the future. So um, the state has been really flexible with the communities and really um, making sure things were locally driven and helpful to the actual community. So um, all the communities have been doing something a little bit different, but um, they are incentivizing um, nature-based solutions. So we'll get into that a little bit um, in a minute. So as I mentioned, we have been working on phase one and phase two. We are very close to finishing phase two, and that's what we really want to present to you today. Um, and then what will happen is the prioritized projects um, that we, as our final deliverable in phase two, one of those will be chosen to move into phase three, and that will happen um, next month, so June of 2022. Um, so really Nags Head was at a really great spot for phase one and phase two because there's significant other planning efforts and initiatives going on. So what we really looked at is taking all of these different um, previously adopted plans and other initiatives that are in the works um, and trying to pull in specific projects that may be um, good for state funding in the next phase. And really, in looking through all of these, um, there were some common themes that we did see throughout um, the other plans and initiatives. 
Um, and there's a really great resilient definition that we use in our phase one and phase two deliverable that was created by the town on what a resilient NAGS head means to you. Um, and so we really built off of that and um, we created a resiliency strategy vision that breeds a resilient NAGS head is a place where our community economy and ecosystems are better able to rebound positively adapt and thrive amid changing conditions and challenges. We strive to preserve and protect the NAGS head character, environment, economy, and sense of place in order to ensure a high quality of life for residents and visitors for present and future generations. Um, so that really hit home for what the resilient strategy goals were and actually um, the goals in your local comprehensive plan were really strong to meet this vision. Um, and so we primarily pulled from your local comp plan. Once we had kind of this vision and goals baseline, we started looking at um, critical assets in the natural infrastructure and hazards that NAGS had needs to worry about. Um, and so what we did is we created an interactive map um, where let's say you might be interested in where all the fire stations are or EMS stations. Um, and you can look at that map. And um, then we've also mapped some of the hazards overlaying onto that map. And so you can really, depending on what your interest is, look at okay, where are the fire stations and are we concerned about flooding around fire stations? That's just one example. Um, you know, where's a nursing home? Do we need to make sure that we can get to that nursing home um, for evacuation purposes? Um, so we build the map, which is a great tool to be able to use, but we really wanted to also hear from the community on um, the hazards that are most concerning to them and what they view as the most important asset. Um, we also asked the community what re resiliency efforts they thought were most needed. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more of this when I get into the um, summary, but really for this project, the um, resiliency efforts are broken down into four different buckets and that's really like infrastructure and nature-based methods so really thinking about like actual construction projects um, and then there's the you know improving resiliency through local policy and regulations um, local plans and then how to educate the community and any incentive programs so we had a great response with the online survey. We had 157 um, with most of those respondents um, having experienced or been impacted by a disaster. Um, and then over 70 of the respondents are concerned about changes to the climate, including an increased frequency and intensity of storm events. Um, the survey was advertised through the town website and social media. So town staff did a great job of really pulling people in and getting interest for that. And so I just want to share a little bit of what we heard from the community. Um, for the most concerning hazards, the top three um, were hurricanes and tropical storms, beach and sound side erosion and flooding. Um, so that's probably not surprising, but um, we really wanted to make sure that we were hitting the right the right hazards of importance. When we asked the community um, what assets are the most susceptible to hazards, um, environmental assets ranked the highest, um, and then infrastructure and people were the top three, um, followed by economics, so local businesses, medical and response resources, cultural resources, and then municipal. 
more than half of the respondents felt like protecting critical facilities, managing development in areas known to flood, and protecting and reducing damage to utilities um, are all extremely important to think about when we're prioritizing these projects. Um, and almost half of the respondents rated enhancing the function of natural resources to aid in property protection as, in, as extremely important. So we heard from the community that the most important assets to them are, of course, emergency service providers, the infrastructure. So this is like roads and bridges, um, utilities and medical facilities. And then the question was asked about what's, what are they most interested in protecting? And it's a very similar list um, to what you just heard, except for homes and neighborhoods were added um, as extremely important for the community. So, I mean, I think that makes total sense that um, people want that's a priority for them is protecting their home and neighborhood. Um, so this is where I said I'd get a little more into the details on the types or buckets of um, efforts that we asked about for this project. So um, over 90% of the respondents selected infrastructure and nature-based solutions is where we should focus our efforts for this project. Um, again, these are things like stormwater improvement, living shoreline projects, rain gardens, beach nourishment, again, like construction type projects. Um, the second one was local and regional plan. So um, stormwater infrastructure plan, emergency operations plan, and then local policy and regulations rank as the third most important, um, and that's really looking at policies and regulations or incentives on how to promote resiliency. When we asked how important specific community-wide activities are to consider pursuing, prevention planning, emergency services, and natural resource protection rose to the top is extremely important. Um, other options included infrastructure projects, public education and awareness, property protection, and historic preservation. So where does that get us? So what we did is we had, we pulled um, possible projects from all of the existing plans, the um, current budget, other initiatives, and really started looking at how these addressed what the community felt like was priority and important. Um, so we also worked with town staff on this um, and got feedback um, from numerous planning board meetings. Um, and then what we did is we really started prioritizing those and we had a large list um, of all of the projects you just saw. And really we started going through them and thinking about um, is it a site-specific project? Is it technically sound? Can it be implemented? So that's very important for the next phase of this program. Um, are there multiple benefits to it? And then um, we also included staff input and community input. So where we are now is we have a list of our top five projects. Um, these are mostly infrastructure and nature-based solutions, and there's some education and public awareness. Um, so just to go through a couple of these projects for you, um, the Old Oregon Inlet Road and um, the Bonnet Street drainage construction, those both come from the stormwater master plan. Um, the old Oregon Inlet is in the southern part of town and flooding has been documented there for years, restricting pedestrian travel um, along the multi-use path and frequently reducing vehicular travel along uh, Oregon Inlet Road. So what this plan is for is approximately 2,000 linear feet of a French drain system 
um, and then looking at additional design services for pump station and dune infiltration system. The Bonnet Street drainage project is in the northern part of town, um, and this area has had insufficient drainage infrastructure along low-lying properties and elevated groundwater, which is causing flooding. Um, and the proposal is a network of per perforated pipes along South Wrightsville Avenue, which will connect to a pump station that will discharge to an infiltration area partially below uh, the Bonnet Street Beach Access parking lot. The Estuan Shoreline Management Plan implementation is really taking three priority projects from that plan and implementing those for a living shoreline. The water quality and groundwater data loggers is a recommendation from the decentralized wastewater management plan, which involves the purchase of 10 groundwater data loggers. Um, and this will assist in continuous remote groundwater elevation monitoring. And then the final one is the homeowner welcome packet is really to provide septic and water quality education materials to new homeowners. So what we'll do is we will put all of these five projects into the chart you basically see um, on your right. And this is the deliverable for phase one and phase two. So we have to have basically our top five projects um, to submit. And then the town chooses one of these projects to submit as phase three. Um, so just a little bit of next steps, and then I'm going to hand it over to Kate to provide some additional information. Um, but really, we completed kind of our deliverable that we're presenting to you um, recently. We have the list of priority projects that I just shared with you. Um, and then the town will be completing the application for phase three on one of those projects um, in June. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but I do, I know it was a ton of information. Um, I do want to pass it to Kate to provide you a little more information on phase three and the priority project, but I am happy to stick around and answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Candace. Does anyone have any questions for Candace? Oh. Not necessarily for Candace, but okay. for Candace or you, would somebody remind me uh, on the survey that the um, results were just presented, um, uh, what was the level of input on that? How many respondents? Um, how, how broad was that survey? We had 157 respondents. Okay. Um, so one, one of the better responses actually from a few, we had a few mm -hmm. surveys out recently. Okay. Um, and that was probably the most response we've gotten. On okay. any of the surveys. All right, good. Yep. Uh, I appreciate that. I realize it was for a specific purpose for yeah. this project, but it, okay. it was interesting the extent to which those responses really jive with the way I think we think about our town and kind of what our priorities have, mm -hmm. have been. So that was good to see. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you, Candace, for that presentation. Um, I would just like to update you guys on the next phase, which is phase three. Um, and really what the state has designed phase three to be is funding for engineering and design services. And it's a very specific $45,000. Um, so any community that participated in phases one and two is then automatically eligible to apply for phase three. So um, staff and um, I think uh, as Candace has mentioned, um, we looked at community feedback as well, but staff would like to propose moving area, stormwater project area number 12 forward um, as the top prioritized project. And so what that would mean is that that would be the project submitted and the state would, um, if we are accepted into phase three, which um, we've been told likely we would be, um, we would receive $45,000 to pay for the engineering and design services for the stormwater project area 12. Um, that project you are probably familiar with. Um, it was slated to, um, you know, move forward uh, in FY 22-23 for design services. So this would be um, covering um, 
those design services more or less for forty five thousand um, dollars that deadline does is June 3rd so it's coming up coming up here pretty shortly um, and that does not require a match so it is forty five thousand dollars so and we we've staff has discussed um, you know and the town engineer that we feel like this would be a, one of the the best projects to move forward. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, board members, Mike. No, I'm in favor of that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I totally support moving forward. I know that NOAA has given coastal management about five hundred some thousand dollars to award these grants. So I think we need to apply and move forward. Okay. Very good, Kevin. Thank you for the work, and I certainly agree with South Nag said that project. Yes. Yeah, that certainly needs to be moved yes. ahead. Thank you. Great. Well, yeah, I agree. It looks, looks really good. Um, um, that's exciting. Good. It's good okay. to see that you know, move um, and to have additional resources for that. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing. It's, it's something we've sort of struggled with here for a little bit, and, and it'll be good to elevate that and get it moving. So that's super. Okay. So the, would the board like to make a, a motion to approve moving that project forward? Uh, I, I think we can okay. can and should do that. So mm -hmm. if if there is a motion to that effect, Mayor, I make a motion that we uh, allow staff to apply for the move forward for the phase three grant. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Candice. Thank you. Great work. Appreciate Thanks, it. everybody. Have a nice one. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is consideration of the adoption of the decentralized wastewater management plan, and I'll call on Kaiwa Shepherd. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I think Holly Miller should be joining us, so I'm just um, going to hold off on a moment and see if she can pop on here. She had a presentation um, this morning. She actually presented um, the DWMP at a separate conference this morning. So it's really cool. I'm going to go ahead and get started while um, she gets in here. So I'm here this morning um, to request adoption for the updated um, decentralized wastewater management plan, the final document. Um, we began this journey in early March of 2021. We've been working with Tetra Tech as well as a, our um, four-person advisory committee to update um, the original decentralized wastewater management plan document. I believe the board um, was given the draft final document in March of 2022, um, and I have not received any comments um, to add into um, the final document. So with that being said, um, I'm here this morning to request adoption of that final document plan. Um, I also wanted to add that the plan recommends the creation a, of a um, voluntary septic maintenance subscription service. And with that, the plan recommends appointing um, sort of an, an advisory committee to spearhead that and flesh out the final details. So if that is something that the board wants to move forward with, um, staff is prepared to come back um, in the June Board of Commissioner meetings with um, ideas and suggestions for that as well. Very good. Thank you, Kylie. Um, any, any questions? Or I, I think I'm hearing the notion that we might be ready to just go ahead and, and move on this, having having had this before us and and considered it. So the board is is a motion in order. Yeah. Make a motion to approve as presented. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve it as presented, and and with that, we'll look forward to staff coming back with ideas for the uh, for the advisory group and make appointments at a later time. Um, any further discussion? 
Hearing none, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, uh, with that, we will come to uh, new business and we will start with uh, committee reports. And I'll start down uh, at this end. Bob, do you have anything to report? Um, not a lot to report. Uh, they're still collecting a lot of data, but it's um, interesting how it all ties together with, with the presentation earlier and what Bob Muller's been doing. So uh, we're looking forward to the next meeting. I think we'll have a lot of results. So. Okay. That's true. Very good. Thank you. Thank Commissioner you. Brinkley. Commissioner. Um, the Coastal Resources Commission met here last week in Dare County. Yes. It's nice to not have to travel. Yes. But um, <laughs> there are some changes coming forward in how land use plans are going to be um, reviewed and adopted, one of which is that uh, communities are going to be required to denote in their land use plans which policies they want to be enforceable by CAMA. Yes. Okay, good. So that's moving forward. Um, it did not. It's reached the round where staff was directed to come back and meet with communities about changes they'd like to see in that policy. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you again for your continued service uh, on that important body. Mr. Sears? Um, I'll just pass along. Uh, the tourism board tabled Is there any action towards the museum at the Adcock Brown Center until more information can be gathered. So I just wanted to update you on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, uh, let me ask you as, um, as uh, our representative on that body, um, do you think it might be a good time to have um, the Visitors Bureau come and update us on we this? should have the Lee and Tim show, the Tim and Lee show come by and okay. give us an update on that, yes. Okay, all right. That's and what I would they're ask. calling it anyways. Okay, all right, very good. <laughs> then I would ask the manager if you would make arrangements to have them on a future agenda to That's update right us on, on what's going on. Thank you. Um, and I will, um, not, not so much um, uh, committee, um, but um, this afternoon I'll be leaving after this meeting to attend the uh, Governor's Offshore Wind Energy Task Force in Wilmington uh, tomorrow. And then um, since I was there, uh, the Beaches, Inlets, and Waterways Association is meeting in Wrightsville on Friday. So I'll be attending both of those meetings. Um, as it relates to wind energy, yes. um, the project off Kitty Hawk has applied for permits. Um, those permits have not been issued because they have still not finished their environmental impact statement. All right, very good. One, one of the things, I, you know, since we're moving quickly, I'll take a moment and share this with, with you since you brought that up. Um, I did have a meeting with folks from Coastal Studies Institute, and one of the opportunities North Carolina missed in the permitting process that would be helpful to them. Uh, Coastal Studies is very engaged in researching energy from water, from currents uh, and wave energy, and they've done a, a, a quite a bit of work in that regard. And um, there are benefits ultimately when that, when that um, technology matures to co-locating that with wind energy facilities because you can use the same wire basically to bring that energy uh, ashore. Um, what Virginia did that North Carolina has not done is that um, when those leases are created in the permit process, we did not include um, water energy as, as a de facto part of the permit. So Coastal Studies, when they want to do that research, they have to go through their own separate permit process. And um, so hopefully when there are other opportunities going forward, we'll be able to wrap all of that together and um, be a little more efficient about the permitting. As you all discussed that, it'd be nice to include the southern, two southern locations, yes. one of which is moving forward, one of which is under a lot of contention, right. um, to have that included as it goes forward with yes. that. Okay, thank you. And I will keep that in mind as we, as we go forward. Um, the next item on our agenda is consideration of board and committee appointments, um, which is um, item H2. Um, Andy, do you, can you speak to this a little bit in terms of uh, vacancies that we have and, um, or a, a board member may be ready to, um, let, me, let me get that open, excuse me. Well, I, 
We have an appointment for the BOA due to a resignation of member John Mascaro. Okay. I think you move the next one. And up. then uh, it, the staff summary notes that Judy Burnett's term expires in June. Yes, and, and she's so interested she in being reappointed. reappointed. So then reappointing her potentially and filling uh, John's position. Okay, thank you. And then you have the Fireman's Relief Fund as well. Correct. Yes, yeah. uh, and, the, and the Fireman's Relief yes, Fund. Wishes to be reappointed. All right, so let's take uh, the, the Board of Adjustment uh, with the vacancy created by um, the resi resignation of John Mascaro. Does, uh, does the Board have in mind a nominee to replace him? <clears throat> make a motion that we uh, appoint Tina Adderholt, one of the alternates, uh, to be a regular member. Okay, thank you. Is there a second to that? Second. I have a motion and a second to appoint Tina Adderholt, who is one of our alternates, um, to, to that position. Just a question. How many boards does Ms. Adderholt sit on? Is this the only one? <coughs> There's been some discussion about how many boards. Yes, yes. I, mean, so I think it's a PGB. PGB? Yes, she's just on this too, and so, you know, she since she's already an alternate on the BOA, right. then it just makes two. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Okay. All right, very good. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, and having a motion and a second, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, Mayor, I make a motion to reappoint Judy Burnett. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second to reappoint uh, Judy Burnett. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, and then uh, finally, Fireman's Relief Fund. Mayor, I make a motion that we reappoint Rose Lay to the Fireman's Relief Fund Board second. of Trustees. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to reappoint Rose Lay to the Fireman's Relief Fund. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is a consideration of a request from the community Claire, care clinic. Excuse me. Uh, Andy? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Uh, Today we have Lynn Jenkins with us. She is the executive director for the Community Care Clinic of DARE. Uh, as the board is aware, they lease a facility from the town, the old Outer Banks Medical Center building on Health Center Drive, where they operate the community care clinic currently. Uh, right now we have a one-year lease with them, which expires at the end of this year. Uh, they have identified grant funds from the federal government, HRSA funds, to form some improvements to the building as well as purchase equipment for the purpose of opening up a dental clinic which could serve up to 1500 persons and so as part of that grant they need to request from the town an extension to the lease and so uh, Ms. Jenkins is here today to present to you a presentation of what they've been doing uh, what they want to do and and what they're asking for so okay all right thank you Ms. Jenkins thank you for having me so I am Lynn Jenkins and I'm a nurse by trade but the executive director at the Community Care Clinic of DARE. After 12 years of working as the coordinator for the donated specialist care for underinsured and uninsured marginalized adults in the whole region including DARE County. Um, so after doing the executive director role for two years and those other 12 years it is imperative that we have some dental option for uninsured and underinsured adults, including Medicare patients, because dental is not covered by, by Medicare. Mm -hmm. And in Dare County, unfortunately, the general dentists don't accept Medicaid for adults. They do for children. So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people without going without dental care. Um, we see it all, all the time. People coming in, they've pulled their own teeth, they have abscesses, they're missing work. It's, it's a real issue, every single person. And in Dare County, unfortunately, we're 15% of our population is uninsured, higher than the state and the nation. And so that, and I bet it's a little bit higher than that because we don't really have the, the 
accurate numbers, I bet. So I want to give a little overview of what we've been doing at the clinic and what we propose to do. So here is, we love our building and we're so grateful for the lease to date at the old Outer Banks Medical Center. And let's see, do I c control this? This one, okay, let's see. All right, so our mission, the Community Care Clinic of DARE provides basic health care, medication assistance, and wellness education for financially challenged uninsured persons living or working in DARE County. We will expand our mission um, to add dental, and we will have a small pharmacy, which are huge improvements for um, the uninsured and underinsured in our county. And our vision is to improve the quality of life for those living or working in Dare County by helping to create and sustain access to health care. Here are our board of directors. Our new incoming chair is Jennifer Allen. And we have um, a member from the Outer Banks Hospital, Albemarle Hospital Foundation, and Dare County Department of Health and Human Services always on our board as they were the three entities that formed the community care clinic back in 2005. So we've got Sheila Davies, the director, Janet Jarrett, who is the director of Albemarle Hospital Foundation, and then you can see our other list of board members. Dr. John Sanchez is our medical director. Our services provided are full comprehensive primary care, health education, medication assistance. We do specialist, like if somebody has a hernia, we'll refer them over to Vidant General Surgery. Um, we do x-ray ultrasound referrals, lab work in our clinic. We have free MRIs and CTs through Chesapeake Regional, I mean Chesapeake Imaging Center. We are state uh, gold standard colorectal cancer screening. We offer COVID-19 flu vaccines testing and have a, done a huge COVID-19 outreach. Sick visits for established patients, diabetic retinal eye exams, mental health referrals, substance use disorder referrals, and medications for mental health and substance use disorder. Who are we serving currently? Just in our primary care facility, we have 730 current adults, 18 to 64 plus. We are 61%, I believe, is non-Hispanic white. And then you can see this orange section are Hispanic, unreported race. Um, two, about 2% 2 uh, black African American, which goes along pretty closely with our uh, demographics of the county. And then Hispanic white are here in the gold. Uh, percentage of federal poverty level, you can see the majority of our patients are 100% below the federal poverty limit. And we do go up to the 300% of the federal poverty limit with the cost of living. In July of 2021, we launched a health equity campaign with some grant money we had from our North Carolina Association of Free and Charitable Clinics to cover a Latino outreach worker, a health educator, um, to really to help our um, uninsured patients that suffer from chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. And just, I know health equity is a buzzword right now, but it's really forced us to look intentionally at every service we provide. And health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. And I love this little. So poor oral health serves as the national symbol of social inequality in the United States and the disparities reflect unequal opportunities to be healthy. And if anybody's ever had an abscess, it looks like this. They can probably tell us right now it's pretty miserable. And if you're missing your front teeth, it's hard to uh, apply for a lot of jobs. So the challenge and the need for dental access, like I said, 15% in Dare County are uninsured. 40% of adults with low income or no private health insurance are walking around with untreated cavities decreased productivity, increased oral cancer, and oropharyngeal cancers were the leading cancer in Dare County in the 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment, which is this. And we actually have gotten a small grant from the UNC Lineberger Cancer Center to assess or oropharyngeal cancers in marginalized populations, and that's gonna be an ongoing one. 
Um, next year, they want to help us do some more implementation of screening for those, which the primary screen, screening for oral cancers is a dental exam. So difficult to get that if you don't have access to a dental exam. Um, and again, 18% of uh, population, I can't read it from here very well, um, or say that their, how their teeth look impairs them from applying for jobs and interviewing well. Here we were out at um, Spencer Yachts doing COVID vaccine clinics. Um, we do a lot of community outreach, but support in the area of the community care clinic, again, is this $423,000 in congressionally directed spending. And to note, this was the first time that congressional spending was allotted to free and charitable clinics. They've always been um, offered to federally qualified health centers, but free and charitable clinics, this was the first year, and we got an advocacy alert through our National Association of Free and Charitable Clinics that now we and the other 80 clinics across the state of North Carolina, they're beginning to see the numbers that we are serving in counties. It's not just the federally supported clinics. Um, and two, this funding is we were the only <clears throat> clinic in North Carolina to get it. We were about one of 15 clinics across the country. And we are also doing, we're in a study with Harvard School of Public Health as one of six clinics in the country discussing the health effects of climate change because of our hurricanes. And they're developing a toolkit that will be a global toolkit based on input from this clinic. So we're really focusing on uh, getting our name out there and learning the best standard of care. So those funds will be released if we can um, <coughs> apply and up, up to the requirements that the HRSA grant, the HRSA grant requires, which is an extended lease, a letter from the landlord, and other items that we have shared um, with Andy that are requirements. They want to make sure if the 423,000 of federal money is being invested in a building that there is a commitment. And I completely understand that to review this and to, if you decide to bless it, that you are committing to us and committing um, to what you feel like the value is of this clinic to the people of Nags Head and those who work or live in Dare County. And um, it is a commitment to that building. We will be adding plumbing and electrical on top of the floor, building a false floor, and putting in the um, dental equipment, the large dental equipment. One room will be dedicated to a small pharmacy so we can provide discounted medications, insulin, things that are very hard to get for folks. Just to let you know, um, we have gotten a three-year grant from the State Office of Rural Health starting in July for three years of dental staff salaries, 150,000 a year, and that is just for salaries. The grant for the, the federal grant is just for equipment and renovations. Um, annual support comes from Dare County to our clinic, 67,500 a year. Town of Kill Devil Hills supports us with 10,000 a year. Outer Banks Hospital covers my salary, plus um, grants for direct patient care, plus local foundations, churches, businesses, and individuals. And to uh, invest in free and charitable clinics for every dollar invested, $7.40 worth of health care are provided. Here is a uh, early schematic of what we hope the uh, building will look like. Down along the bottom, these are current uh, clinic rooms, exam rooms, offices, the back right part of the building. I don't know if that's east, west north or south but this where my this is where the little pharmacy would be we would have rooms for the um, you can I don't know can y'all read that probably not let's see well you can hopefully look at can you all see it on your yeah okay you can see it but we'd have three operatories <laughs> an x-ray room a lab so that we could actually make partials for people who are missing their front teeth and then you have to have the rooms for ventil uh compressor, vacuum, and a sterile area. So that is, look, this was done by the Henry Schein Dental Equipment Company. 
we had to serve 1,500 the first year, which would equate to about two and a half appointments per person. We know that these folks are going to take more than just a cleaning every six months. They're going to have some pretty in-depth um, dental work needs. It will be uh, based on a sliding fee scale. It will not be 100% free clinic. There's no way to sustain that. So based on household income, they will pay on a sliding fee scale. Of course, if someone absolutely cannot pay, then it will be free to them. Total startup cost around 450000 and then we'll have an annual operating budget for just the dental section of our dental clinic. It is expensive, 550000 Right now, our clinic side is just under 400000 Luckily, cost-sharing benefits are we already rent from you guys at a wonderful rate that we are very grateful for. So we'll be under the same roof. There won't be additional rent requirements for us. We will share our front office staff, our waiting room. We'll share our educators as we integrate medical and dental to treat the whole person. And I just put in here a lot of the different collaborations that we currently have, which are definitely a strength of ours locally. All the nonprofits, we work closely with them. We hope to be the clinical site for College of the Albemarle's dental assistant program if they bring it down to the Dare County campus because they'll need clinical hours. Regionally, we have a lot of collaboratives, state and nationally, as I mentioned. So that, and this is some pictures of inside the clinic getting education and picking up foods for our patients from the Beach Food Pantry, and then just references. So if anybody has any questions, I'll leave my business cards and a flyer for everybody. Or I don't know if we do question and answer oh, or yeah, yes, how that cer works. certainly we will. I, okay. I, I, thank you, and and I apologize for for actually not knowing a lot about the great work that y'all were doing uh, back there, and so I thank you um, for for presenting that to us, and we uh, appreciate having y'all as a as a tenant there, and I, I know that um, uh, there is a value to um, our contribution there, and um, uh, so, and I, I don't know if we could put a number to that, but that may be a beneficial number to add to your slide in terms of Absolutely. what uh, the value of our, of our reduced uh, lease is. Um, it, I'll ask questions from the board, Commissioner Sears. No questions. Commissioner Cahoon. Only that will the new lease include the fact that we still have the right to have an emergency operations center there? Uh, that's a good question. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. your, your phones are still hooked up. They might be a little um, getting Dusty. old. I don't know. <laughs> they're, they're sort Dusty. of being probably turned, yes. you, probably turned yellow by now. But, uh, yeah. I don't Mr. see Brinkley. why that would be a problem for us. I just thank you for the, a lot of work goes on in that little building and we just thank you for what you do for the people of Dare County. Well, we thank you all as well. And we'd love for you to come for a, vi a visit anytime. And we also have our location in Hatteras at the Frisco Health Department as well. Commissioner Sanders. No, I just echo what you say. That was a very informative and impressive presentation. Thank you. Thank we love you. what we do. Do you have folks with you today that you'd like to introduce? Our new pharmacist that will be into, she will be our nonprofit safety net pharmacist, Karen Reeder, right here. And she can speak to any pharmacy questions you have, but will be a godsend to our patients as she is very, wants to do a lot of consultations with them and provide medications at a much lesser rate than they can get otherwise. Yes, uh, uh, and that's a, that's a desperate need. Yes, it is. Um, John, any, any comments about lease modification or Anything we need to hear from you at this point? Just a few observations on steps that the uh, board would need to take here. Um, the uh, the grant requires that the uh, first uh, that as part of the application that the landlord the town as landlord submit a letter saying you support this project and would agree to uh, the terms that are required for the grant to be awarded. One of which is agreeing to an extension of the lease to be a five-year term. Um, and uh, 
I don't know that that's a particular problem, except that the mechanics of getting there is a little bit tricky. Uh, in order for the board to extend the lease beyond one year, you have to have a public hearing on 30 days notice. So um, if the board were to conduct a public hearing on this, it wouldn't be before the letter is needed. And so my, having reviewed these materials, I believe that the town could issue a letter indicating that it does support this project and would agree to extend the lease following the public hearing unless there's any adverse comments or reason not to do so. So you'll have to have a qualifier in there. Um, but then if everything goes as expected, then you could go ahead and enter into the, the extended lease. I also don't see any problem with being able to reserve the town's existing um, emergency operations center. There's no other terms of the lease that would have to change other than the length. If there are no uh, further questions for, for uh, Ms. Jenkins, then um, I think a, a, the motion would be essentially uh, that the town issue a letter of support for the uh, grant supported project with a qualification that the town will extend the lease for five years subject to a public hearing um, and that the town will reserve its operations center for the period of the extended lease. Does that sound right? Yes, sir. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Uh, it's a good thing we hit that at 10 because I had failed to notice that was time specific and yet yet was, we managed to do that just I'm right we're doing great <laughs> <laughs> made it look effortless yeah, all right and it or, appears the next one's here so. uh, uh, and if yes if they're they're here then we'll move that move right on to that one um, and so the next item on our agenda would be consideration of a request from Dominion Dominion Energy um, Andy yeah we do Yes, we do have representatives from Dominion here today, and uh, our understanding is this is a request for an easement for underground utilities along Old Nags Head Woods Road, and it, it is a split uh, between Old Nags Head Wood, Woods Road in this area is split between town ownership and Nature Conservancy ownership. This, this is the portion of the property that we own solely uh, that encompasses the fresh pond so it's right when you enter the town from Kittleville Hills and uh, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Dominion so they can provide you with more information about their needs all right very good. welcome gentlemen hey, how are you thank good. you so much um, first off thank you for letting us come here for with this request uh, as the town manager said we are requesting a utility easement going along uh, old Nags Head Woods Road uh, this is under Dominion strategic underground program it's a reliability effort uh, it's in conjunction with the customer base of Dominion. Basically, uh, we provide free underground with them along with the overhead removal of the top 10% of outage prone customer base with Dominion. Uh, so essentially Dominion goes out, finds the top 10% of their customer base uh, that is most outage prone from their overhead lines because usually overhead lines are the ones that cause the most issues during storms and gale force winds, that kind of thing. Uh, and so basically what we are doing is we are starting at uh, 2042 Old Nags Head Woods Road, which is up the road a ways, uh, and proceeding down the town right of way along the edge of the road uh, until we reach 2300 Old Nags Head Woods Road. Uh, so essentially this easement uh, that is on the 285 acre property that the town owns uh, is simply just so that we can get our line from one adjacent property to the next. Uh, no, no equipment will be placed on this property. Uh, it's basically just a, a highway for the line to, to travel. Uh, so we will be doing at least two splice pits since it's a fairly long run uh, because we can't go about 700 feet until we have to do another splice pit. But again, no equipment will be placed. Uh, and basically, uh, we, you are not relinquishing any of the rights to the property. It's still your property. It's more you're giving us permission within those bounds to, one, place our lines underground. And then if we ever need to maintenance those lines, we have your permission to access those lines as well. Uh, and this, this parcel uh, really is, is the best side of the road to be on uh, because the Nature Conservancy uh, unfortunately takes a fairly steep drop off um, and if anyone is in construction knows not great when you're trying to set up heavy machinery 
Uh, so it would be most beneficial to be on that side of the road to run the underground line itself. Uh, and again, we'll be removing about oh, just under three quarters of a mile of overhead uh, utilities. Uh, it's only uh, electric lines that are overhead currently. And this will just really add a lot of benefit to the customer base. There are currently four customers on this route, uh, on this route that we are taking uh, that are constantly losing power from the gale force winds, the nor'easters, the hurricanes, because they're right on the water. Uh, so this will be really beneficial to them. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, feel free. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Is there an existing easement for the overhead lines that um, essentially goes away when the overhead lines are removed? So, so the overhead easements will remain, but they will be essentially abandoned since the, the overhead line. So with our construction, it's in different phases. Mm -hmm. So the first phase is when we actually come in with our drill teams and drill the hole. And then our underground team comes in and pulls the conduit through the hole that was drilled. And then our overhead team comes in and removes all of the overhead line as well as any poles, which since this, uh, this property and this project uh, is only electric lines on the poles, there's no joint use, so no other utility is on the pole, they will be coming out as well. Okay, good. It will also be visually nice to get rid of the poles and the lines yeah. going, going through Nags Head Woods. Yes, and, and the, uh, uh, all the customers on this program have, or this project in particular, have actually already signed on. Uh, so, and, and they're very excited about everything. We're just waiting for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I've already talked to the steward there. He's very excited about getting the overhead lines out of there sure. uh, so they don't have to remove any more trees with the, the overhead maintenance. Uh, we're just waiting for the, their legal team to <laughs> give okay. authorization for that. Right, okay. All right, commissioners, Bob? Well, sounds like they've done their homework. Sounds like yeah. a win-win. Good, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm ecstatic. I wish you could do it throughout the entire day. <laughs> well, that, that's, yeah, that's what we, we're doing. So we actually just started this, this, uh, this contract with Dominion. Uh, the, this first round of projects is actually the first time that the strategic underground is really kind of entering into North Carolina. Uh, we've been doing it for many years up in Virginia. Uh, it's been very successful. So we're very excited about entering into this new territory and, uh, and hopefully we will be expanding to, uh, to the other areas as well. So yeah. right. good. Yeah, thank you for getting it done. Appreciate it. Yep, Absolutely. We, we do. All right. Then I believe we have a need a motion to approve the easement request. Mayor, make a motion that we approve the easement as requested. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Look, Appreciate look it. forward to that. All right. Great news. Yes, it is. Uh, Mr. Lighty, items referred to in presentations from the town attorney. Uh, I have nothing uh, beyond what I've already discussed um, and uh, discussion for closed session. Okay. All right, very good. So we'll circle back to the closed session. Uh, that brings us to uh, items referred to and presentations from the town manager. And I, board, do we need to take a break before we launch into the, I, I was thinking at least before the budget presentation, but maybe now is a more appropriate time. So yeah, so let's take a, let's take a 10 minute recess. Thank you. The, the board has returned to session. Um, the next item on our, our agenda are the items referred to and presentations from the town manager uh, with a number of items. So I'll turn to uh, Manager Garvin. All right. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, as the board is aware, we have been working on projects uh, this year in several neighborhoods. We had plans to uh, conduct water line improvements and drainage and paving in Old Nags Head Cove, and we were also looking at performing paving and drainage improvements in Nags Head Acres. So as part of those projects, we also sort of mid-year started looking at uh, installing sidewalks in certain areas within those neighborhoods in advance of the paving work at the suggestion of, of the board. And so since that time, we've gone out and, and uh, received bids to install sidewalks in those areas. And so David is going to go ahead and give you an update on that. And what we're seeking is for the board consideration of, of approving a budget amendment uh, so we can perform the work. 
Yes, uh, good morning, uh, good Mayor morning. and Board of Commissioners. On April 26th, we went ahead and we received bids for the two sidewalk projects, uh, one in Exit Acres spanning from US 158 down to, back to Bridge Lane, as well as the old Nagshead Cove subdivision, and that spans from West Old Cove Road from US 158 to the intersection of South Cobia Way, and then continues down South Cobia Way down around the curve to South Pamlico Way. And we had received uh, three bids for that project, uh, one from Hatchell Concrete, one from uh, Fred Smith Paving Company, and one from Finley Asphalt and Concrete. Uh, Hatchell Concrete had submitted the lowest bid, and that amount was $186,298.75. Um, this scope of work was, was, was not previously budgeted, and, and so uh, we're asking for this request uh, via a budget amendment and authorization for the town manager to move forward with the execution of the construction contract. Um, but uh, before I get into that formal request, I wanted to pass along some um, communications that we've had recently regarding this project. Um, I did receive a call from former Commissioner Sadler yesterday uh, voicing op opposition uh, to the installation of a sidewalk over in Old Nagset Cove. And I also met with Dave Masters Jr. yesterday on site to go ahead and review the proposal. And he went ahead and did some outreach with the Homeowners Association. And he sent an email this morning with some comments and some feedback that he received from them. And I just wanted to go ahead and share that. Um, they, there are most people within the community that, that do support this proposal, but, but there is some opposition. Uh, I, I don't have a percentage of what that breakdown is. Um, along with this proposal, there came some other excuse me, suggestions within the neighborhood. That was uh, a three-way stop at two separate locations, one at the intersection of Finn Lane and South Cobia Way, and uh, a three-way intersection at the uh, intersection of Sandpiper Court and West Sandpiper Terrace. Um, they, I, I, I think those suggestions uh, stem from some of the uh, occurrences of speeding within the neighborhood, um, some which have been addressed during the project construction for the Waterline project by having some, uh, by having the radar trailer there on site. I think they have, the residents have found that to be extremely helpful, um, especially with the impacts from construction. But long term, uh, these are some of the suggestions that were made uh, to address some of the traffic. Um, there is also a suggestion about an extension of the sidewalk um, going around Old Cove, Old Cove Road and extending all the way through West Danube Street. Uh, there is also a suggestion of a lower speed limit uh, maybe a reduction in the overall width of the sidewalk and um, a uh, question as to whether the town would maintain the area in between the sidewalk and the edge of pavement. So I, I just wanted to share that information with the board, uh, but um, this request is for a budget amendment in the amount of $205,000 to cover the proposed scope of work, plus a 10% project construction contingency, as well as authorization for the town manager to move forward with the execution of the construction contract with Hatchell Concrete. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Board members, questions, comments? Commissioner Kazee. No, I would say I would refer to the appropriate departments, the request for three-way stop signs, right. um, and have that evaluated. Yes, I agree. I agree. Dave, from, from the letter that you read, or the email from Mr. Mas uh, Dave Masters Jr., would it be safe to say they had just had other suggestions to aid uh, their neighborhood instead of opposition to the sidewalk itself, you think? Uh, it, it, yes, it, I, I think this is... As we're talking about the sidewalk project, well, you know, we also have some traffic issues, and this are, are some of the suggestions on how to resolve some of the traffic issues as well. So I would echo what Commissioner Cahoon said that we do forward that and let, let the appropriate people look at that and see if additional 
measures need to be taken there. Okay. All right. I think we'll do that without a vote. So we'll just direct the, the manager and the town engineer to refer those questions. Just like a motion. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, sure. We'll take a motion. I'm going to make a motion that we approve the budget amendment as requested. Okay. Right. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the budget amendment as requested. Any discussion? Did you have a question? I have a question, yeah. Yeah. You, you don't know how many people were against it and for it, you were saying? There wasn't I, any. I, I do not. Okay. Um, that I, I only heard directly from former Commissioner Sadler uh -huh. and then Dave Masters Jr. He canvassed the Homeowners Association board members and I. He did not give me a percentage of what that breakdown was, but okay. it, it seemed like there was more in favor than there was opposed to it. Seems like it, but I mean, we could always check that out. And, and one, one of the things that, that we can do um, is we can go ahead and sequence the construction. We've got two separate projects, one Nags Head Acres, one old Nags Head Cove. We can do Nags Head Acres first and we can do some public outreach to see exactly uh, what their concerns are and, and um, come up with some solutions on how they could be addressed. Okay. We, right. did hear, we did hear, I heard from former Mayor Muller also yes. supportive of the projects this morning. Yes. Okay. And what a benefit it's been, even of just striping the road has helped. Yeah. In his, er, in his road. Like, yeah, seems like yeah. more people would be in favor. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second, um, and we've had discussion on approving the budget amendment. So all of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. And then we need a, um, a motion to authorize the manager to enter into contract. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize the manager to enter into contract. Any discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the Soundside Road traffic update. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, um, <clears throat> last month the board heard from residents of Soundside Road uh, concerns <laughs> about uh, traffic and safety, um, particularly the speeds and volume of traffic. Um, volume of traffic associated with the Soundside access. Um, we were asked to look at solutions to assist with some of these concerns. Um, prior to Eric, the public works director, leaving, he had evaluated some things we could do. Uh, so we came up with three things. Uh, one would be installing speed cushions along the length of Soundside Road. And they're, they're similar to a, a speed bump. However, they're, they're sort of a rubberized material, sort of low profile. And there's a gap in the cushion that allows for a, a large vehicle to, to pass through the gap and not have to go over the cushion. And most vehicles could just put one tire over the cushion and one in the gap. So I think uh, certainly uh, less concerning than a speed bump in terms of impact on vehicles. Uh, so that we would have two uh, setups along Soundside Road where we would place speed cushions. Uh, we also looked at placing signage uh, that would inform drivers of the speed limit and also their speed. So kind of like a radar sign, a digital radar sign. And uh, we've got, we, see, we received pricing for that. And the final recommendation would be to lower the speed limit on Soundside Road for the portion that's not already 15 miles per hour to 20. And uh, that, would, that would be approved under the next item for the traffic control map amendment because we are proposing that in other areas as well. So um, if the board is amenable to these requests, we, we do have pricing. We're ready to issue purchase orders to, to go ahead and move forward with these items. And so that's what is included in the budget amendment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'll, let me make one more note about the budget amendment. We, we are also looking at purchasing two additional setups of speed cushions to be able to use in other areas as needed. And we were going to purchase some additional radar uh, speed limit signage. Uh, we plan to put that signage down in the whalebone junction area uh, for the summer season. So the budget amendment also includes those purchases as well. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, board members, questions for the manager? Um, 
Hearing none, then a motion to approve the budget amendment would be in order. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the budget amendment. Any further discussion? If I could just make one comment, uh, and I appreciate you mentioning about the speed cushion versus a speed bump. I think the one concern that we had from a resident was uh, low profile vehicles, but <laughs> it sounds what you're saying. It's totally different than a speed bump, and it's not going to interfere with low profile vehicles. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, they are. Um, I've been looking at those, and they're, they're only about three inches high. They're seven feet long, so they're not steep. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they'd only be uncomfortable to go over at, at really high speed, right. I mean, which is the purpose of them. It's not, mm -hmm. not to bust somebody's tires. It's just to make they're, it uncomfortable not, to go over it fast. And they're not, they could be used as a permanent installation, but they don't have to be. Sure. So these could be moved to other locations depending on what the need is and what, what our experience with them is. So. I, I think it's a good experiment. I mean, we'll, we'll see uh, if we can get a handle on, on that speed uh, issue with these. So uh, having a motion and a second on the, uh, on the floor and having had discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the long-awaited traffic control map. Andy? Yes. It, <laughs> it has been some time coming now. Um, <laughs> So the board heard an update on this, I believe, last month. And uh, we were asked to look at uh, updating this map as, as far back as last summer. And we, we started this project by uh, actually putting together an inventory of all of our signage uh, using GPS and GIS. And so uh, we've been working on that for a while. And that's really what's taken the most time here. We had to go and set up the database. We set up a website to be able to post the, the data to. <laughs> and uh, we had to do the field collection. So I, I'd really like to thank Karen Hagee in Public Works for, for doing the, the data collection of these signs. There was over 2,000 signs, and we have really good information on, on all of our signs now. And we can tell you how many you no know, parking signs we have and how many speed limit signs. And, and uh, what we found out is we really have a hodgepodge of signage out there that's really been placed over the past 30 plus years. And there's a really a need for some standardization and, and consistency in signage. Um, and this, this allows us to really take a close look at that and, and see how we can work to adjust some of, this, uh, some of the signs that are out there. So basically what we did is we took uh, the map that Carolyn and Michelle had been maintain maintaining over the years that uh, basically indicated where all the ordinances had been adopted and we digitized that information and put it onto to a GIS map. And then we overlaid the, the sign information on top of that so we could see what was actually in the field. And we went ahead and provided a, an, an update to the map that not only reflects the old ordinances, but the current conditions. And so um, we did make some policy changes with this map. Um, I guess the biggest one would be uh, US 158 in the causeway. Uh, previously, that wasn't shown as a no parking area, and we're, we're showing that entire length as no parking with this map amendment. Sort of the question for our police department was, you know, why wouldn't it be no parking? And I think everyone agreed that it, it should be no parking. And, and typically, we haven't had a problem with this, um, but it, it's something that, as we're updating the map, we felt like we should go ahead and do. And there's some other uh, fairly minor changes that were made. Um, between the highways and the northern part of town is really the most complex area in terms of no parking. And we've got blocks and partial blocks that are no parking as shown on the map. And we've got areas that we probably need to go out and add signs or revise the signs to better reflect the no parking areas. So uh, rather than show the signs on the map, we just show lines on the map that, that indicate no parking areas. And then we can go out and sign those areas however works best, depending on if it's a full block or half a block. Um, we show the entire multi-use path along the, the length of the town on the beach road is, is no parking, multi-use path. And, um, you know, there's no through trucks areas, which we've had for years, mainly up the, nor the northern portion of town. And um, we've added some additional stop signs. Uh, but I, we think this, this map fairly well captures um, both his history as well as current conditions. And we know there's gonna be future amendments to make, but this is a baseline to, to start from. 
uh, to have a digital version of the map. And we can also use this <coughs> and post it on our online GIS so the public can view it in the future as well. And um, so with that, you know, we, we would like the board to adopt a, a brand new map which would supersede all prior uh, maps and ordinances. And um, just like to thank Michelle and Carolyn and Karen and the police department for, for the help in putting this together. And uh, glad to bring this to a conclusion. Okay. All right, very good. Commissioners. I, thanks for all the work in putting this in place. Mr. Kahane. It's a great map. Good grief, it's a lot of stuff on there. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify, point for my edification, um, memo talks about west side neighborhoods. It does include north side neighborhoods as well, too, correct? North side? Like Pond Island and uh, Lone Street Village are north side. They're not west side neighborhoods. They're north side neighborhoods. Yes, you're right. So it would include those it, it, north Yes, it, I, should have, I should have clarified. So the second piece to this is that not only are we, we essentially adopting a new map, but we, also, we are also addressing a, a need that we've heard uh, for the last year or so from a lot of our west side neighborhoods uh, that speed, concerns about speeding and enforcement. And so one of the recommendations that I was going to ask uh, Chief Webster to talk about was the, a recommendation to lower the speed limit in all of our west side neighborhoods and north side neighborhoods to 20 miles per hour. And so that would include essentially from, uh, I believe it's Carolinian Circle, uh, along the west side of 158, down to the causeway, to also include uh, Lone Cedar Village and Pond Island. I've had a lot of requests from Pond Island. They've had so, the same issues back there. So this map shows all those roads as 20 miles per hour, and <laughs> what we've asked the board to do is adopt the map with an effective date of June 1st, We've already ordered the 20 mile per hour signs. That would allow us time to get the signs into the ground and, and sort of set ourselves up to be able to educate folks on the speed limit and also conduct some enforcement. So oh. that, is, that is what we're asking today. May I make a motion to adopt the map as presented? Okay, thank you. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Thank you for the work. It really looks good. Thank Excited you. to have this. Yeah, very good. You're welcome. All, right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye aye opposed thank you oh sure and then it i guess that included the adoption of the ordinance by adopting the map mm -hmm. okay yeah. all right uh next item on the agenda then is um a request to revise the planning department org chart and the grade list so as you know, uh, Kelly, since she was promoted to planning director, has been somewhat short-staffed. And, and she has also been working to try to determine how she would like the department <sighs> to function under her leadership. And so uh, she's now asking for some changes uh, to the, the organizational chart and to some of the positions in the department. She does have a plan to fill these positions. She's filled most of them and has a few, well, at least one more to go. but. Uh, at this time, she would like to ask for a change uh, to essentially eliminate two former positions and add one new one. And uh, so in the, in the package, you have a new org chart for planning as well as a new grade, position grade list. And maybe Kelly could just get up briefly and, and talk about uh, what her plan is. Morning again. Good morning. Thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, Andy addressed it really well. Um, as he said, we had previously had um, the principal planner position as well as a senior environmental planner. Um, our senior environmental planner has now been promoted to deputy planning director. So um, essentially, that was a two sort of specialized planner um, positions that. I truly do feel would be best suited to just combine into one broad planner position and not a specialized position. Um, I, I won't go into a whole lot of detail with it, but many of you may know that <clears throat> the town has um, for many years sort of segregated residential zoning administration and commercial zoning administration. 
um, several years back. We lost that, um, so we have one physician doing um, several different duties. So if we add the planner position back into the organizational flow, that gives an opportunity um, to allow more um, uh, a specific staff person to um, contribute more time to commercial site plan review, um, administrative review, minor site plan review, things of that nature. Um, and I, I genuinely feel that by doing that, it's, it's going to help our permit turnaround, our availability um, for questions, customers, walk-ins, just the amount of time that we can spend working on educational efforts, um, that type of thing. So that's long-winded, but that's my <laughs> request. Okay. And if anyone has any questions, I'll do my very best to answer them. Yeah. Just for a point of clarification, we're being asked to adopt the organizational chart. Am I safe to say the one that we're adopting is the one on the screen and not the one currently in our program here? Yeah. Yes, sir. That is correct. Um, I did fail to mention this was revised yesterday. Mm -hmm. It did get updated into onto the um, website and the intranet. It did not get updated into your package. In our packet today is this one. Not mine. Not mine either. Yeah. There, there's a um, on on the website. If you go to the agenda, there's a, a grade or an org chart revised item that Carolyn had added yesterday afternoon. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And so that's what's on the screen here. Yeah. And if it, other, others have it, I just didn't and just wanted to clarify that. Just so. this would be what Perfect. I'm requesting approval of. Thank you. Okay. Good. <laughs> Mr. Sanders? I don't have any questions now. Mr. Brinkley, anything else? Yeah, I else? fully support the changes that you're looking at. Thank you. Make it. Yep. Can Mr. continue? Yeah, I mean, I like the idea of combining and, you know, broad training. Um, I, you made some nice changes in your department. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Sanders? Look forward to the progress. Yep. That's why. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, then a motion to approve the revised organizational chart would be in order. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Add the grade list to that. Oh, I'm sorry. And grade list. And grade list as well. And I'll second that. And, and this, okay. All right. Very good. All right. Any further questions then? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. All right. The budget. All right. Big budget. Thank you. That's just fine. No, no, no. I'll read it later. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, right? Nice. <laughs> Tonight when I can't sleep. Yeah. So it's 11 o'clock, and I didn't think we would be this far along, so I don't want to mess up the mojo with a long presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, um, I'm happy to be here today to present to you the FY23 budget. Um, this has been a, a long process, and it's the result of a lot of hard work from a lot of folks on our staff, uh, primarily Amy Miller. Uh, but also Brooke Norris and Roberta Thuman and uh, Jan Mielke, our human, human resources manager, and others as well. We've certainly had a lot of help from our department heads, our deputy department heads, and our office managers. We've all worked on their own departmental budgets to, to, to present you the document that you're going to see today. 
Um, the, board, the board is familiar with the process we've gone through. Uh, we started back in the fall, I would say, with our strategic plan workshop. And uh, we, we continued that process on at the beginning of the year with, with so, sort of a new process that we established and really with the goal of aligning the board's goals with a reg recommended budget. So hopefully at this point, you're gonna, my, my hope is that you're gonna feel like this is less of a surprise to you uh, than in the past and that there's really not a lot of things you haven't already heard. So we've had more meetings up front this year than we've had in the past to try to give you information and get feedback so you understand what's in here. Um, so this chart is in your budget, uh, but it's also on the screen and it just sort of talk, walks you through the process that we've, we've used. And uh, we're at the presentation of the recommended budget. Um, next step would be our workshop, which I believe is scheduled on May 18th. Uh, and then we also have scheduled a public hearing for June 1st on the budget. Again, hope is no surprises and that you're familiar with, familiar with what you're going to see. Uh, so one of the focus, one of the major focuses we've had this year is ease of understanding. And one of the points we make in, in our message is that the budget is becoming more complex. Uh, the town is growing, the budget is growing. We're, we're starting to embark on, on new initiatives and funds. Uh, this year we have a new fund called the Capital Investment Fund. And uh, you, you heard about that in some of your workshops. And so we really are trying to make the budget a little bit more simple to understand. And so when you look at your departmental budgets, you have a new format that's a little bit different than we've had in the past. You've got a, kind of a basic summary of each department. You've got the organizational chart. We actually have a summary budget chart, um, which basically is not a line item budget, but just a, a summary budget. So broken down into personnel operating, uh, capital and uh, cost reimbursement. And so then the line item budget is on the following page if you're interested in that level of detail. But then for those that just wanna see the summary, there's a separate summary table. And there's also some charts and a graph uh, along with each budget. And then on the, the last page of each departmental budget, there's a summary of, of the capital in improvement or capital investment fund uh, items. So anything that's being funded out of the, the new CIF. So uh, moving on, um, we also have some new elements to the budget, which you'll see in the table of contents. So we've uh, added a community profile element to the budget, which <laughs> describes a little bit more about Nags Head. Uh, provides a little bit more base for the, the reader on our community. Uh, we have included some information on how to read the budget document, uh, specifically how to read the budget tables and what, what information they contain and how you might compare like the estimated actual budget to, to the recommended budget and to the requested budget, what all those things mean. Uh, Amy has included uh, charts on the flow of funds for our, our different parts of the budget and uh, I know she was really excited about this. We are too. And uh, you'll, you'll see those referenced in the table of contents. We've included our strategic plan in the appendix of the budget so the reader can understand how the budget uh, requests align with the strategic plan and the priorities of that. So we're hope, hopeful that's helpful. And then we also have a glossary of terms at the very end of the budget to help people understand some of the jargon that is in all budgets that had confused me for years. So. Thanks to everyone for putting that together. Um, we'll start out with a, a little summary of the, the biggest item this year. So in your uh, pre-budget workshops, we started out talking to the Carters, Doug and Andrew, about the Capital Investment Fund. And this was really born out of the Public Works project because that is such a big project, we're trying to figure out how we're gonna tackle that. And so one of the, the items the board really wanted to pursue was the town seeking a bond rating so that we can uh, open ourselves up to better financing options, longer terms, and better interest rates. And so the board had uh, already authorized the town to pursue that. And as part of that, another element to that is the capital investment fund. So creating a separate fund that we would use to now uh, fund our capital projects, our equipment, and our rolling stock out of. So really kind of separating, separating that out from our operating costs and our personnel costs 
so we can really do, do a little bit better job long-term planning and strategic planning for capital needs and it really dedicates financial resources every year um, to, to these needs and the board certainly approves the annual contribution every year. And we talked about this in your, um, in your pre-budget workshop. We sort of identified an amount that we would like to contribute. We've changed that a little bit in the budget and that was just based on uh, looking at how to balance the budget. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. W one of the biggest benefits of this fund is that it's going to carry a fund balance. And so when we have years where we have higher uh, needs for, for expenditures, like four trash tr trucks in one year, we can use that fund balance to offset those, those years with higher expenses and not have to necessarily rely on financing. And so with this capital improvement fund or investment fund, we are looking at paying cash for most of our capital needs and only really financing the largest purchases and really at this point it would only be the public works complex, the debt on that. Everything would really be cash at this point in time. And with this budget we're proposing, we're looking at paying for everything in cash except for the, the public works complex. And so that, that's a pretty big change. So in order to do that, we're looking at seeding the capital investment fund for the first year with $6 million. And so how are we gonna do that? Uh, what, what we're looking at is changing our fund balance policy. And so we have a fund balance that we estimated, I guess, last fall at about $8.1 million. We're estimating at the end of this year, we'll probably be close to $10 million in our fund balance. And so we think we could change the fund balance policy. Currently it says that we would, we would have a fund balance of 50% of, of our general fund expenditures, less bond debt or $5 million which is the minimum, we would be looking to change that to about 25 to 35%, so changing the range, which would still allow us to maintain a fund balance of $5 million. And um, our impression from the board is that the board really wants to be aggressive in, in pursuing um, projects and, and getting things done. And even last year, rather than contribute money to the fund balance, the board purchased over a million dollars worth of items during one of our CIP workshops. Uh, and so this, this really aligns with that, that goal. So we're gonna monetize the money that has traditionally sat idle in our uh, fund balance and use it in our capital improvement fund and, and allow us to, to pursue a lot of these things uh, that we, we've been talking about. So general fund summary. Uh, this year's budget is $33,255,283. So that's a $6,849,817 over last year's budget, which is 25% over last year's budget. But there are reasons for this. I don't want to scare anyone. So what we're doing, as I mentioned, is we're transferring a, a fairly significant amount of money from our fund balance. So we would be looking at transferring $3.3 .3 million from the fund balance. And we also have several large projects in the budget with grant revenue, so that's also going to increase the budget. As you're aware, we are looking at applying for grants, or we have actually already applied for grants for the water lines in, in Vista Colony, for the smart meters, for Whalebone Park. And so if you look in the budget, there is actually a, a section on the, the grants we're going to apply for, for both general fund and water fund. Um, it's a significant amount of money, which has increased the budget this year. Um, we have also increased shared revenues, and so uh, as the board is aware, we have been over in our shared revenues for the last few years, and we anticipate being at least $1.6 million over in shared revenues this year, uh, which is what Amy's estimating to be at the end of this year. Uh, we also raised taxes last year two pennies, which as you know, raises our, our levy. And so we expect to get at least $300,000 or more in additional shared revenues because we did that. So in light of that, we have increased our budget for shared revenues for this year, but not as much as what I just described. We still remain conservative with that. And I think one of the things Amy looked at was uh, being more cautious on land transfer tax, not knowing what interest rates might do. So uh, I think she feels good about that. I know she's collaborated with Dave Clawson and some other local finance officers and others about uh, this recommendation and, and she feels good about it. So 
Um, the shared revenues are budgeted about, budgeted about $1.3 million over what they were last year. But we did raise taxes last year and we came in $1.6 million over. So I know the board does not want to continue to raise taxes and still be that much over in revenue. The other, the other item that I mentioned is employee costs. We, we have been very aggressive in this budget in maintaining uh, our um, pay and benefits uh, for, for employees and try to keep up with inflation. And so I'll, I'll show you that on another slide, but that is one reason for the increase. Uh, it's about a million dollars dedicated to employee increases, and I'll go over that. Um, with all that said, this year we're not proposing any, any tax increases. So. Uh, no townwide tax, no MSD tax increase, and no water rate increase. So this was a, a little bit of what I was already describing regarding shared revenues. So occupancy and land transfer taxes increased by 11%. Sales tax increased 14%. Uh, we forecast a continuation of a strong occupancy and sales tax, tax revenues, and uh, the tax increase as I mentioned from last year, it did generate additional shared revenue, which we factored into our forecast or our budget. Um, I already mentioned the shared revenue increase of $1.3 million is what we included in the budget. However, we were cautious over land transfer and we actually reduced the budget over what we budgeted last year in land transfer um, fairly significantly. And so this is just a summary table that you'll see in the budget on revenues. I've already sort of covered this. This is the capital investment fund. So we're looking at a, a fund balance transfer of 3.3 million. Uh, and that goes along with this revised fund balance policy, which is included in your budget. You have probably, a, I think, three, three new policies in the budget that go along with the capital investment fund, one being the fund balance policy. You also have a capital investment fund policy uh, and, and a debt policy or debt management policy. Uh, so we're looking at seeding the CIF this year with $6 million. Um, I already went over the fund balance policy recommendation, and uh, this is something that uh, Doug and Andrew Carter did help us out with, and it's something that they're used to seeing in a lot of the communities they've, they've done these CIFs with. So getting to expenditures. So we, we continue our focus on assets and infrastructure. As I mentioned, public services complex is really driving a lot of, a lot of what we're doing. You know, that project is estimated at like $15.3 million. And um, we, would, we would make our first debt payment on that next year, but that would be a partial year debt payment and it would be interest only. What we were talking about doing is, is not making principal payments until the project is complete and we have a tangible asset in hand. And so that's what we're looking at for the first year. Um, we, we continue with our combined street stormwater and water projects. Next year, we're looking at paving along uh, East and West Soundside Road, uh, East Barn Street, um, as well as the beach access, uh, Bladen Street between Wrightsville and all the way back to the beach access, uh, South Memorial Avenue between Bladen and the Southern Terminus. So sort of in the area where we did the drainage project this year, we are also looking at doing a pipe replacement on East Barn Street and um, what we plan to do, and the board is already aware of this, we haven't paved the Coburn exit acres yet. And so our goal would be to uh, do all the preliminary work for these and so we could do one bid package for paving and get all the, those, that work done together, likely in September, October timeframe. Uh, we're also looking at uh, reconstructing the Conk Street and Hollowell Street beach accesses. And one of the things that I do need to point out to you and uh, I've talked to some of you about this. In the past, we've always paid for this through the general fund. And Commissioner Cahoon has mentioned that in the future, uh, DCM might uh, allow us to apply for grants for replacement of beach accesses. That historically has not been something they've favored. So we will be looking at that. Uh, for now, we're looking at paying for this, not out of the general fund, but using the, the, the MSD, the sales tax portion of the, the revenue generated by the MSD to pay for, for these. So not the MSD taxes themselves, but the additional sales tax that they generate. And so this is, um, this is about $130,000 worth of work and certainly helps us out in the general fund to pay for the other items non-beach related. We also have other projects you're familiar with from the CIP, including skate park, dog park, whalebone park, 
and we beach road multi-use path. I don't, I don't have to go over those again with you because you're familiar with what those are. Um, as I mentioned, we have a table in the budget that deals with the grant funded projects. So this is the uh, general fund table and this is the water fund table. And the water fund is actually uh, sort of beating the general fund this year. The total grant project from the water fund is $2.6 million. And that also includes the, the septic health recommendation for the water quality and groundwater data loggers. Um, another major uh, change this year that we see is the um, sanitation expenditures. We have the rollback service, uh, which we've initiated already. We're looking at budgeting revenue from that in next year's budget to pay for our contract, which is $195,000. Last year, we were paying about $35,000 out of the general fund to pay for the, a limited rollback service on the beach road. We're converting that to a fully funded fee based uh, program. And so we, uh, we have included that in the budget and we also have included the fees for that in the fee schedule. Tipping fees have gone up substantially. They continue to go up not only in volume, but in cost per ton. So now we're looking at going from $77 per ton to almost $90 per ton for tipping fees. And that's in addition to the additional volume that we've been seeing, which I will note the recycling program has, has helped offset some of the increases in the volume, the tonnage. Mr. King. Andy, is the $6 per ton surcharge fuel? Is that? Yes, the fuel surcharge. Okay. So, so the, the surcharge covers the fuel. What's driving the other $13 a ton? Yeah, Increase. well, the, it's 77, 84 minus 77, so it's about $7 oh, a ton. And I guess that's just the normal operating cost that the, the, the county gives to us for operating the landfill and, and all the other facilities that they maintain. What was the previous years? In, I mean, what, what was the previous increase? Well, it, I think a few years ago it was about $73 a ton. Last year it was $77 a ton. And now it's $84 a ton. Okay. The county doesn't own a transfer station anymore. Except for that. So. They've shifted a lot of their stuff to the other regular programs. Moving on. Um, other things we are seeing ocean rescue. This is something that the board has been aware of for the last few years. Our shoulder season seems to be growing, our beach populations uh, are growing. And so we've been maintaining a presence on the beach for longer and in higher numbers. So we are requesting funding uh, for a higher <coughs> volume of lifeguards to be on the beach during the month of September. And we're also requesting funding to maintain at least two supervisors on staff all the way until November. And we've been doing that already, but that's just reflected in your budget for the coming year. We're also looking to raise the, the minimum pay for lifeguards to fifteen fifty an hour. It was fifteen, and we feel like that's in order to stay competitive. We heard one of the local water parks was paying fifteen fifty an hour for, for lifeguards, and um, I'll, I'll just I'll just note that um, we have a fee or sort of a pay schedule for for lifeguards depending on how many years you've you've been with us and also based on certification. So. You know, if you're a three or four year employee and you have an EMT certification, you make more than 1550 an hour. Based on your calendar that you've presented through September and through October, now might be the appropriate time to approach the Visitors Bureau about um, what the true occupancy tax is for, which is the impacts of tourism, their long term restricted funds. Um, since we're extending lifeguards, there's always been a disconnect opposition of which I've been opposed to at funding um, reoccurring expenditures. But now that we're seeing longer seasons, earlier and longer seasons, now might be the time to revisit that um, funding from the Visitors Bureau conversation about funding for lifeguards, not just for Nags Head, but for all the other communities as well, because the season has increased for the entire area especially since it's falling in the shoulder season, well, which is what, their target. Yeah. yeah, it is the shoulder season. That's been the area that they were created to bring new visitors here, mm -hmm. and it has worked. Okay. And now that it's worked so well, <laughs> now's services. the time to pay for some of the services that <laughs> the, the impacts are causing. Right. Um, 
you know, you know if you, you read the, the message that we included in your budget, I sort of based it off a question I was asked recently. Uh, I was interviewed by, by Milepost about what are some of the things that we've had to, to deal with because of our uh, increased volume for not only seasonal but non-seasonal visitors. And so we s sort of came up with a laundry list of things and, and sanitation was one of the big ones, ocean rescue was one of the big ones, and sort of a lot of these things that we've included in the budget really reflect the question and your priorities. I mean, we've had to incur a lot of expenses. Even though we've seen additional revenue, we've had a lot of additional expenses because of the impact pre-COVID to now. Yeah, the same additional revenue we've seen, the Visitors Bureau has seen as well. Right. So their, their budget is increasing, so now it's time to probably broadly spend it throughout the communities. Understood, that's a good, good point. Last few items I have on this slide, uh, I'll just, I just made a note about the replacement schedule for vehicles and equipment. That's been a priority made by the board, and so we reflected that in this year's budget and in the CIF. So all the things that you saw during the, the um, this capital improvement program workshop and then even the, the vehicles that didn't make the, uh, that don't qualify for CIP items are also in there, including I think police has four vehicles in there and there's several other trucks and passenger vehicles in there for various departments. We also have uh, an item here upgrading our police RMS system uh, to be uh, consistent with the county, the project that we talked about with Motorola. And so that, that is reflected in the budget. Um, so this slide is about staff. So, you know, the board has really come on strong in the last few years and wanting to make sure that we're honoring our staff uh, through pay, benefits, training, and, and engaging work environments. So that is one of our prongs of our strategic plan, and it's something that we're trying to not only reflect in the budget, but in our day-to-day -day operations. So this just summarizes what we included uh, for staff in this year's budget. Uh, so we are looking at a 6% cost of living adjustment in the budget. We're also looking at continuing with our within grade increases, which we've been doing for several years to move folks along in their pay range. As you know, the COLA moves the pay range, and so this would allow them to progress through the salary schedule. And what we've been doing is 2.5% if you're below the midpoint, 1.25% if you're above the midpoint, so we have budgeted to continue with those. We've also budgeted funds to continue with our career progression programs and expand those to other departments. Uh, we, we did um, receive an increase from North Carolina Local Government Retirement System uh, for both non-LEO and LEO uh, employees. And so those percentages you see up there is, is the increase that we've been given. So we've had to budget for that. Um, we did not receive an increase on our health insurance this year, thankfully. It was a good year for us. As the board is aware, we are now going to offer this year an option for an HSA to our employees, and so that, that process is underway right now. We're doing some educational sessions uh, with employees to, to help them understand whether that's a good fit for them. And then, as you recall, a couple of years ago during our pay and class study, uh, Becky Vesey presented the board with uh, comparisons, a uh, survey from other local governments in North Carolina on what they're doing with 401k. She had recommended going up to 5% over the course of three years. So last year we went from 2% to 3%. This year we're to go to 4% and then next year would be 5%. Um, rather than go to 4% this year, we recommended just jumping right to 5%. And so Part of this is, you know, inflation. You know, I think there was, uh, you know, inflation is probably a little bit higher than what we budgeted for COLA, but rather than give employees more for the COLA, we felt like it would, since we were gonna do this anyway, it would be better to just go ahead and, and get to the 5% for 401k to maintain our competitiveness with that. And that's for non-LEO employees, LEO employees, are already required to receive that per statute. So um, our budget reflects that increase in 401k. And, and as you know, last year was the first year we did not require a match. And so th this is something the employees are going to get. And we certainly encourage a match, but it's not something that is required at this, this point in time. Um, 
this slide looks at organizational and position changes. Uh, last year, we combined the uh, position. We promoted Amy to deputy town manager, which was one of the best decisions that we made. And we have combined the position, and so her old position is not in the budget. Um, we are proposing to add a facilities maintenance technician, and this uh, was in the plan year budget last year, but what we found is that we were looking at eliminating a prior contract we had for bathhouse cleaning that we started during COVID, which was about a little over $30,000. And then, as you know, we were paying $35,000 for the uh, cart rollback fee last year or the service. So by converting that to a, a, an entirely fee-based program, that essentially covers the cost of that position. So we would be adding a position to facilities maintenance and that would be to assist Bobby Hooper with stormwater. And so that sort of meets our goal for, for maintaining our stormwater uh, system, drainage system. He's been doing a great job. Um, we are recommending moving the uh, part-time events position to a full-time position in planning. Uh, I think you heard some great words from Paige Griffin about all the activities that we were um, very successful with last year. We want to maintain that momentum and, and build on that. We had requests last year from the Arts Committee and from the community we couldn't fulfill because of our limited resources with that. Uh, we sort of feel like this is a low cost, high return for the community. Uh, initiative and so we would like to convert that position to full-time and uh, we do generate revenue uh, as part of the vendor fees from the market and also we're looking we've included in the fee schedule a new sponsorship program for some of the events like concerts and movies we think we can be successful with that so with this we think the revenue generated from some of these activities would pay for at least half of this position um, so also in planning a, the last bullet just speaks to the information you received from Kelly earlier on what she's planning to do with her department, eliminating the two positions and adding one planner. And so that was also reflected in the budget. Um, so water fund, this is just sort of a summary of what we're looking at. Um, you're already aware of this, the asbestos cement water line replacements in Vista Colony and smart meters, we were, we've applied for grants for both of those. Uh, Nancy's looking at SCADA redundancy and in implementing that in, in the water plant. Uh, several vehicles. We're doing a water system master plan update, which I think we do every five years. That's on schedule for next year. And then we've budgeted for all the recommendations in the septic health program. So we're going to apply for a grant for the water quality and groundwater data loggers. That's a fairly significant expense. And so when you look in the budget, you see the increase in septic health. A lot of it is related to that grant revenue and also uh, if we res receive the money to, to actually purchase those items. Um, the committee proposed increasing the, the, the pumping credit for, for septic tanks from $45 to $150. That's resulted in about another $27,000 increase in the septic health budget. Um, we're increasing the, the funding for the loans to $60,000. And uh, that was also a recommendation from the committee. We're also proposing to increase the water quality monitoring. And so uh, that's in there as well. Uh, with the fee schedule, um, as I mentioned, we're looking at event sponsorships. We've added that to the fee schedule. We've added the cart rollback fees to the fee schedule, which you should already be familiar with. We are proposing to increase some of our zoning fees. Um, Kelly and I have been talking about this. You know, if you look at the time that we spend on a text amendment or a map amendment or a variance, you know, the fees we've been charging in the past two or three hundred dollars don't even touch the amount of time uh, to deal with these items and especially since in the boa we have uh, multiple attorneys representing us it's we feel like we need to raise these fees uh, to better uh, capture our costs and so we're proposing to do that for both zoning amendments map amendments and variances um, <clears throat> beach driving has been a big discussion with the board uh, Linda gave me a report on beach driving yesterday, and I think we generated about $50,000 through beach driving permits this year. We had, I believe, 1,900 permits. Keep in mind, this is a $25 fee, um, so that's a lot, lot of permits. We are, we are recommending increasing the beach driving fee to at least $50. 
I mean, now I've heard comments from some of the board members that perhaps it should even be higher or perhaps there should be a, a tiered structure based on whether you're a property owner or not. And we can certainly look into that, but just for the purposes of budgeting revenue, we budgeted uh, a beach driving fee of $50. Now we assume that we're not probably gonna get as many permits because we increased the fee. So we reduced the number of permits down, but that, that was included in the budget. And then finally, uh, the, the item you approved earlier with Amy with the system development fees, those were also reflected in the budget. Of course, the fee schedule was already amended today for that. Uh, Andy, you know, just, just to interject while you're talking about the beach driving fee, you know, the, the, the two-tier fee, not, not unlike what we did with the uh, rollback service where, you know, residents got a break um, or were able to opt out on that would make sense if we're going up. Uh, also a question, what, what does that do with their partnership with Kiltable Hills if they are um, not going to keep pace with our rates? Well, I, I did speak with... Um, the town manager in Kildable Hills about this, and she understands some of the issues that we've been dealing with here in Nags Head, and there's sort of a desire here to not only look at our rules and our season, but also the fees. And as the board is aware, that Kildable Hills had added a, a, a week, or a day or a week fee a few years back of $10, which we don't do. So there's already some misalignment there. And so I feel like, um, you know, it, if, if they're not ready to move forward, then we're probably going to need to move forward, and that would mean we would have to un decouple um, our permits from theirs and just have our own ordinance. And so we could do that over the course of the summer, and we can have more discussions with the board about this during our workshop, but I think it would mean that. And I can certainly follow up on with them to see if they're interested. But um, beach driving, you know, is becoming a bigger issue. We've had, it, it's requiring a lot more management now than it has in the past, and so um, we feel like the fee needs to reflect that. Andy, as part of that, get ready for a budget workshop. Um, if there's a 10-day permit, how, what kind of, is it the same decal? Is it a different decal? Um, how does a person or any of our police know that that permit's not good in Nags Head if it's a 10-day permit? That's a good question. I don't, I'm not sure how I even know the answer. I, I don't think I've even seen what that looks like. And I wonder if it was a different per decal, but it just, because we don't have a 10-day permit, are they allowed to drive a nags head on that 10-day permit? I bet they have been. I bet it's the I bet same they have permit. I, 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 bet bet I think that has created issues for mm -hmm. us, and I applaud you for increasing, or the proposed increase. Mm -hmm. I may be asking for something a little bit more, but I believe separating may be, may be in our best interest. Okay. Based, yeah. and that's just speaking off the cuff for me. But well, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't have the details from the board yet on on what your desire would be. But so we just proposed sort of a, a number. That's good. Yeah. So, that brings us to the end of the presentation. You know, I believe we have a workshop scheduled for the 18th, which would be the mid month meeting, and um, this budget, the budget document will be on our website today. And uh, you can find that under the finance. We'll send a digital copy to the board. You have the hard copy. And so uh, just thanks to all the staff again for helping to put this together. And thanks to the board for all the patience. And I know you've had some marathon sessions over the last few months. So thank you for all your support and willingness to listen to our suggestions. So thanks. Thank you, Andy. Questions um, at this point? Board? Thank you for your presentation. Look forward to getting into it. Yeah, yes, I do too. Thank you. All right. Thanks for all those who stayed late last night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. It's a good, it's the first buzz is a good program, a good budget. Yeah. So I'm excited to work with it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, we'll see how it all shakes out. But the fact that, you know, I mean, we're, we benefit from a, from a healthy economy here, but the town's also made some good decisions in terms of, of, of what it's done with the budget. And to look at, you know, all the things we'll be able to continue and do for our citizens and not have to raise taxes, I think is, man, that's really exciting. That is just really, and take care of employees at the same time. That is very exciting. So, thank you. Very good, thank you.
Um, so that brings us to um, the request for a closed session to consult with the town attorney. Before we take that motion, let's do the um, Board of Commissioners agenda. And I'll start down here with um, Commissioner Sanders. Do you have anything? Not at uh, this today? time. Thank you. Commissioner Brink. Yes, sir. Commissioner Cahoon. I have one item, Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, it has come to my attention that we have a vendor that has a contract with the town, um, which I think has worked very well. We adopted our decentralized stormwater management uh, plan today. Mm -hmm. um, but I am concerned about a vendor that, um, while in a relationship with the town, has also hired a town employee mm -hmm. that was working with the same plan. And I just think that on the part of the vendor, that's pretty um, shaky business practices. Mm -hmm. And I would ask that the board request the mayor to write a letter to this company expressing our concerns about what contractual arrangements are and the ethics that are involved when those contracts. Uh, thank you. Um, we had discussed this and I, you know, I, I have been composing a letter in my head uh, because, you know, it, it's really not fair to anybody. They did good work. It's not the employee fault and and it leaves it's going to leave everybody with a little bit of a bad taste on on an otherwise excellent um, project and product and um, so yes I'll be I'll be uh, if the board um, is affirms that yes I'll be happy to write a letter to them I certainly agree with you okay Not nothing at this time sir okay thank you um, and I don't have anything um, else to add uh, at this point, um, and so, I, oh, I will tell, I, I will share with all of you, um, which I shared with Commissioner Brinkley at our last meeting, I believe it was, when we approved a resolution about the Currituck Bridge. Um, we discussed a resolution about the Alligator River Bridge. And so I looked at the resolution that we did about two years ago um, and it was at that point when they were soliciting public comment for the 2020, 2030 10 year plan. Um, and, and so that, and our resolution was geared toward the public comment period. So I was looking at revising that resolution to bring it back to you. I said, well, let me go look at the website and see where all this stands. So I went to DOT's website and, um, that process that we passed our resolution toward in 2020, they had so much backlog on projects and no additional money that in October of that year, they suspended that process. So they took public comment and, and essentially shelved the idea of a new plan and uh, continued with the plan that they had in place. And I went and looked at how uh, I found the scoring and I looked at how Alligator River scored under that plan and there are three scoring categories. I can't remember exactly what those are, but Alligator River is in the bottom 25 or 30 percent in every scoring category. So it was not going to move under the system they're using. The bridge was not going to move up and they had suspended that process anyway. So I talked to the town manager and what I'm considering instead of just another resolution, because it does need to be addressed and we have, do have employees who, who cross <coughs> that bridge. So what I'm intending to do is to get uh, probably the Kill Double Hills mayor, the Dare County um, uh, board uh, chair, the Terrell County board chair, and the, perhaps the Columbia mayor who may have similar interest about employees going and residents going back and forth and see if we can get a meeting with some of our legislators um, to highlight the highlight the bridge because I don't think another resolution in that overall scheme of things is gonna uh, is gonna do anything so I just wanted to let the board know I'm kind of baking on that plan right now if you get that meeting maybe express a concern about how the new DOT budgetary process yep. discriminates against rural areas. Yes. Um, it's all catered to urbanization. It is. And there needs to be some equity brought back into the system. There, there, there does. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
any other business to come before the board today? All right, uh, hearing none, then Mr. Leidy, I'll ask you to make your motion. Or Thank make you. a make a motion for yes, us sir. so one of us can say. Well, I, I'm gonna ask that somebody make a motion that the uh, board enter closed session pursuant to general statute 143-318.11A3 in order to consult with the town or attorney regarding matters uh, protected by the attorney-client privilege and to protect that privilege uh, regarding various matters, including the uh, Cherry Inc. Oceanfront Cottage. So I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And the board will remain here for a closed session. And um, so, and I think the only folks we'll need back after that are obviously the manager, but I, I think the clerk and uh, Roberta will be the only folks we'll, we'll need back after that. Thank you all. Board has returned. The board has returned to open session, <laughs> Mr. Lighty. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. The uh, uh, the board did discuss matters that are protected by the attorney-client privilege. Some directions were given, but no uh, no other actions need to be disclosed at this time. All right, very good. Anything else, board? Mike, did you think of what you? Uh, I didn't. All right, all right, very good. If there's nothing else, then a motion to adjourn will be in order. Is it recess. Oh, I'm sorry, we yes, recessing? we will be recessing to the uh, board budget workshop on the 18th at 9 a.m. The move. Second. Motion and a second. second? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Thank you. Board in recess. <laughs>